So the stuff I talk about in this video is really important because at the moment the planet is f***ed. And the reason for that is that for the last few hundred years we've just been burning anything that we can. Coal, oil and gas, all of these things are releasing a huge amount of CO2 into the atmosphere and that's changing the climate and that's a scientific fact. And the problem is, it's only going to get worse in the future. Because in the future there's not only going to be more people, but we're also actually going to have to generate a lot more electricity. Now at the moment, probably about 40% of the energy demands that we have is supplied by electricity. But there's also about 40% of, of our energy demands are for things like heating. The heating in your school, in the office, at home, is often gas central heating. So even if we had renewable energy that created all of our electricity, we'd still be burning natural gas at home for our heating. And also, at the moment, we're still using uh, diesel and petrol for our cars. And if we're in the future we were to go to electric cars, then we need to generate more electricity for that. So, in the future, we're going to have to generate a lot more electricity, and also there's going to be more people. So how can we do that? Well, the problem is that oil, coal and gas are all running out pretty quickly. And also, so is uranium, which is the fuel needed for nuclear fission. So in 500 years' time, we wouldn't have all of the fuel that we need to actually generate electricity. But there is a solution, which sounds simple, but actually trying to get it to work is quite complicated. And that is nuclear fusion. Now, if you take heavy elements and you split them apart, um, the mass changes and we release energy. But the same thing happens if we have really light elements together. What we can do, we can fuse them together, we can join them together, and actually then that means the mass of what we create is less than the mass that we had to begin with. And this change in mass, because some of that mass is transferred to energy, um, is actually then used to, gen to basically heat stuff up, to boil water, and then the fusion power stations would be very much like a conventional uh, power station, where you've got hot steam passing through turbines, which causes generators to turn, which then generates electricity. So let's have a look a little bit. Uh, uh, let's have a look at that in a little bit more detail, I suppose. And um, the best way we can think about it is using Lego, of course. Now, the yellow ones are protons. The red ones are neutrons. So this one here is the nucleus of deuterium. Deuterium because there's two things in that nucleus. We also have tritium, which is another isotope of hydrogen. We can see that they both have the same amount of protons, but tritium has two neutrons. And of course, there are three things in the middle. Uh, this is called tritium. And actually, the, the way that we want to get fusion working on Earth is a little bit different to what happens in the Sun. In the Sun, there are a load of different processes. We start out with hydrogen, combining with hydrogen to make deuterium, and then we have a different sort of set of sequences that end up making helium. In nuclear fusion reactors on Earth, the plan is that you have deuterium nuclei. So this is a plasma. Plasma is just a really energetic gas. Because there's so much energy involved, all the electrons have been stripped off, so we're looking at these positively charged nuclei kind of flying around. And if you can get a deuterium to meet up with a tritium, the two things join together. Uh, for a very small amount of time, it makes helium-5. So two protons and three neutrons. This is helium-5. It's an unstable isotope of helium. And then it decays by neutron emission to make helium-4. So we start with deuterium and tritium, and we end up with helium-4 and a neutron. And that's basically what we're trying to have happening on Earth. Now, if it was easy, we'd already have this, uh, these fusion reactors all over the place, because effectively, what we get at the end of this is we get some helium gas, which is not only good for party balloons, but also really important for cooling down things, for example, like MRI machines. And also we get some neutrons. And these neutrons can then go off, and because of the amount of kinetic energy stored in them, we can then effectively get this kinetic energy out of these high-speed neutrons. We can collide it with something else, a kind of blanket that's surrounding the fusion reactor. That heats up that, and that can then be used to heat up something else to then boil water to make steam and so on. So really, um, if we could get fusion working, we start with deuterium. We can get lots of deuterium from seawater, and there's a lot of that on Earth. We can actually make tritium in the fusion reactor itself. And at the end of it, we have these fairly inert things like um, just helium gas and neutrons. So one of the downsides is that uh, sometimes a nuclear reactor, um, so the fusion reactor, gets radioactive as well, but I'll talk about that later in the video. So what can we do? What can you do as future engineers and physicists? 
Well, basically, um, there's a place where they're doing a lot of research on this, which is just near Oxford at a place called Cullum. And I went there on a visit and I had a look around the facilities and a really interesting talk with some of the people who work there. So JET stands for the Joint European Taurus. Um, the Taurus is kind of sort of the kind of circular bit where this fusion happens and there's a good reason for that. And effectively JET is an experimental reactor and it's got a Q factor of about 0 0.65. What's a Q factor? Uh, we often use Q for thermal energy, uh, but a Q factor is really the ratio of the power out compared to the power in. Now at the moment, um, they do actually have uh, fusion happening there for several seconds and it's contained and it's, it's all working, but they can only do it for a short amount of time. And actually, even though they take a lot of energy to get things up to the right temperature, you know, there's a lot of power needed to kind of actually run this thing. They don't get out as much power out as they put in. But that's fine because this is very much an experimental reactor. And actually the technology is based on stuff which is from the 1980s. I think it was first uh, built in 1983 which is almost as old as I am, and therefore that's really, really old. But JET is very much where they're doing a lot of research, and that's a bigger project called ITER. Uh, and this is, again, this is using countries from all around the world. We've got people like China, Russia, and America, as well as lots of European companies, uh, countries actually working together. And that's really, really exciting, because if this works, it can work for the whole world. There's about 35 countries involved. And that's very much going to have a Q factor of about 10. So that means for every watt that they put in, they get 10 watts out. And that's what you want. You want to have this kind of break-even point above one, where even though it takes a lot of energy to get the fusion actually happening, we get more energy out than we put in. And that's actually then in the future going to be used for other things like STEP and other different sorts of uh, reactors where they can actually be used to generate electricity. So how does a fusion reactor work? Well, effectively, what we need is a plasma. So this is just really highly energetically charged particles. And uh, if we can get them going quick enough, there's a chance that they overcome the electrostatic repulsion between the two um, particles. Um, if we get them colliding quick enough, they can actually then join together because the strong force takes over. Now, inside our sun, which is the hottest place in our solar system, the centre of the sun is about 15 million degrees. But actually, we want to have you know, even hotter conditions on Earth of about 150 million degrees. And that's a, you know, because effectively, the hotter the temperature, the higher the kinetic energy of the particles. Now, the quicker they can go together, the more chance they've actually got of colliding. You might remember from things like Fleming's left-hand rule that if you have charged particles moving in a magnetic field, they experience a force at right angles to that, the Lorentz force. And this is actually what is, this is how we actually contain and control what's happening inside that reactor. Because we have charged particles, we contain them by a big magnet, and that means there's always a force at right angles to the direction that they're moving. And that means they move in this circular path. And we have to do it by basically levitating these particles because you can't put them in a physical thing because as soon as they touch anything else, they'd lose all their energy, they slow down and they stop being a plasma. So inside the fusion reactor at JET, the plasma is actually this kind of pink colour. Well, in actual fact, the plasma that we need, you can't see because it's so highly energised, um, it's kind of, you know, effectively colourless. But what we do see sometimes are these pink bits. And the pink bits are where you have the uh, deuterium and tritium actually losing their energy. And as they lose energy, the electrons can actually jump down um, the electron shells. And as they do that, they give out this pink light. In actual fact, you can see this in the lab. If you have a discharge lamp that's got hydrogen inside, the um, spectral colour of hydrogen looks pink. And actually, if you see videos of the kind of uh, the pink plasma inside, that's not what you want to see. That pink stuff that you see is energy particles which are kind of losing their energy. And actually, you often see at the bottom where they um, kind of tend to kind of heat, meet this kind of massive heat sink where they're losing all their energy, and that uh, that's kind of where fusion is actually not really happening. So, inside the fusion reactor, you have loads of these particles, and every time we have a deuterium uh, tritium reaction, it gives out about 14 mega electron volts which is actually a relatively small number. But we have 10 to the 30 collisions per second, which means in one second we've got 10 to the 30 neutrons being emitted by that fusion reactor. And that's really what we want. We want to have as many things as possible so that the very small change in mass of each interaction actually generates enough energy for us to use. And what happens is, is that these neutrons go out, they hit um, on the outer parts of the fusion reactor some lithium. 
And lithium is used for a really good reason. Because when you um, have lithium, which is quite a light thing, and you basically get that to absorb a neutron, we can make some tritium, which we can then use for future fusion reactions. But also the idea is that inside these kind of lithium kind of uh, blankets or outside the fusion reactor, you have molten lead. And that molten lead can then effectively carry away the heat. You put it into a heat exchanger and that molten lead then heats up water to make our steam. That's how we actually get it to start generating electricity. Other things inside the fusion reactor, well, again, we have things like beryllium, and you have these kind of beryllium shields on the inside, so that if that, uh, the, f the, the plasma that we're trying to contain, if that hits the side, it's not going to start wiping out the kind of the good stuff that we need there, but effectively that plasma can uh, hit the beryllium, take some beryllium off, and then that kind of drops down to the bottom. I think I remember that correctly. And also at the very bottom, we've got things like tungsten, which is a really dense, heavy element. And we have this metal, which basically allows at the end uh, some of the heat of that plasma to be absorbed by the tungsten rather than being absorbed by other things. So actually, although there's some kind of proper particle physics involved, they actually need engineers to actually make this stuff happen. And actually, I suppose in the fusion thing itself, there's a lot of stainless steel that everything is made out of. And over time, because we have things like steel which are being bombarded with neutrons, we actually make that steel and the other kind of things like cobalt inside it into different isotopes. So there might be cobalt and stainless steel, it gets neutrons being absorbed in that stable cobalt nucleus, and then it becomes a different isotope, which then decays. So one of the problems is that when you have this fusion reactor running, is that over time, the actual reactor itself becomes radioactive. We've activated those elements inside, and some of them have a very short half-life, some, some of them have a really long half-life, and what that means is that over time, you can't get people to go inside and actually carry out maintenance. We've got to use robots that basically come in and they can do all the maintenance inside. That is a downside to fusion, but compared to the amount of nuclear radioactive waste that we have in fission, it's pretty minimal. So something I didn't realise before I went to JET was that this is very much the experimental fusion reactor. It's not designed to generate electricity. But what they'll do is have deuterium reacting with other deuterium, which is also another fusion reaction. And that means they're not having to use a really rare and expensive tritium. The problem is if they used it all the time, they did lots of deuterium-tritium reactions, then there wouldn't be enough tritium left to use in the bigger reactor ITER when they actually finish that. So what they're doing is they're really looking at uh, developing the robotics so they can uh, send robots into fusion reactions, they're kind of looking at the temperatures and actually how you contain that field. Because the containment time, when you actually confine that plasma when fusion can happen, is actually quite hard. Because just like you have um, solar flares on the sun where everything looks stable and suddenly there's this kind of burst of plasma, the same thing happens inside uh, these reactors. And if you have a burst of plasma, it hits the wall, that gas cools down, and then suddenly that plasma collapses. And the reason that that only happens for a few seconds is because the technology, some of it is really old. So they've got big copper uh, things for kind of having their electromagnets rather than using superconductors. And it takes about 40 seconds to actually get everything kind of warmed up and ready. They inject the fuel and it only lasts for one or two seconds before things start to overheat and they have to shut it down. So the confinement time is maybe one or two seconds, whereas in the future we want that uh, plasma to be confined for hours so we can just generate electricity reliably. But I thought it was a really, really fascinating thing to see. They do do public tours and school groups can go along and if you get the chance to do that, please ask your teachers to get along there because I think it's really interesting to kind of see the cutting edge. And this is vitally important because if you don't get fusion technology working, then it's going to be, you know, the plan is only going to get worse and worse and worse. So what's it need? Well, it needs people like you to be interested in physics and engineering and actually overcoming these problems. Um, it also needs money because obviously there's a lot of stuff there that takes a lot of money to actually get running. And also, I suppose it needs the will of governments to think, OK, let's fund this. Let's make this a priority. And that's where it comes down to people like you. And actually, the movement is already kind of starting about people being really concerned about the environment. And that's the thing that in the future can allow fusion, which is technically possible, to actually be our ready source of energy. Anyway, um, I know I've been talking for a while. I hope I've not lost too many of you. If there's stuff there that you maybe didn't understand, you can always go to alevelphysicsonline.com where I've got lots more videos that explain about this kind of really interesting bit of particle physics. And why not subscribe to me on YouTube to stay updated with all the other videos that I'm making. Some of them are aimed at GCSE. Some of them are aimed at the A-level physics exams. And there's videos like this which just anybody can understand because I think that learning about this stuff is really, really important. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.